for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology activists uh, for here for Elite Forward in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that is being set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your Tonight, we're going to be continuing the theme from the rest of the year, which has been the theme of resilience. And I'm super excited to dive into a specific topic tonight, which is the technology of resilience. We're going to look at it from a few different directions. We're going to look at how technology can play a role in helping us understand individuals' resilience. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to talk about genetics. And we're going to get really right to the point of the matter, which is what is the technology in here? human to human and inside all of us that actually drives our resilience and what can we do about it. It's going to be a really awesome show and I'm so glad that you're here with us this evening. So a warm welcome. Um, you know, we are kicking off tonight. Uh, I just want to say a shout out to all of the meetup groups that are watching all around the country, all around the world. Super exciting uh, to see many meetup groups still converging via Zoom or in person, outdoors, you know, keeping that community resilience going, uh, groups of practitioners being together. And we're gonna speak a little bit more about community resilience later because that is actually the topic for next month's functional forum coming on August 3rd and we'll be talking a little bit more about it. So let's get started with jumping right into the technology of resilience. So if you, uh, when you thought of that topic and when you sort of imagine what it would be in your mind, you probably thought we we're gonna be talking about some sort of like wearable devices or understanding how technology is being used to understand our resilience. And that's exactly where we're gonna start. So I'm super excited to welcome as our first speaker, Dr. Molly Malouf. Uh, she is a physician in San Francisco. She has been right at the sort of epicenter of where functional medicine meets technology for the last few years. Um, I've heard her give a number of great talks on the future of technology and how things are rolling out. And it was just a really exciting time to connect back in with her because you know, technology is, is moving uh, really quickly. And there are a number of uh, factors that are being used in real time to determine our resilience. So let's kick off uh, and start with our first interview with Dr. Molly Malouf. Enjoy. So a warm welcome back to the show, Dr. Molly Malouf. Thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. So we want to talk about the technology of resilience and obviously resilience has become a really hot topic in the last few months for reasons that we probably all know. But, you know, what, what are your thoughts about resilience as a concept and, and are you excited in, uh, about this uh, sort of uh, move towards resilience as a marker? I'm extremely excited about it because really one of the hallmarks of resilience is adaptability and sustainability. And I've actually given speeches before on, you know, titles like the sustainable body and what is health it's about adapting and self-managing in the face of adversity so resilience is really more important than ever and building resilience into your body is not something that you may know how to do and so it actually takes an understanding of the nature of resilience in order to practice um, lifestyle habits that can build it within you so that you can handle major life stressors and bounce back quickly when you're hit with something that's pretty tough yeah, absolutely. So I know that you've been uh, really uh, interested specifically on the technology of resilience. Sure. You know, where do you see, uh, what, are, what are some of the markers of resilience that you see technology companies in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in digital health looking at as good markers of, uh, of, uh, of healthy resilience? I mean, the, the, the biggest ones that I think are probably the most important are um, continuous glucose monitoring data 
will give you a really strong assessment of your metabolism and how resilient your and metabolically flexible your metabolism is to the food that you're eating. So you can wear a glucose monitor and it's essentially a diagnostic tool and a, and a treatment tool. So you can use it to identify if you have healthy metabolism, if you have healthy blood sugar, if what you're eating is causing metabolic dysregulation or enhancing your ability to have a steady energy supply throughout the day. So fundamental to survival is healthy amounts of energy and healthy amounts of food and access to food. But also fundamental to health is the ability to go without food and not completely fall apart, not have hypoglycemia that leads to feeling like you're gonna pass out. So when you're metabolically flexible and you're able to fast, your body can easily shift into ketosis and you're able to raise your ketones and having access to food. This is fundamental to help you out our life. And the thing is, is that I've been preaching this for over a year now. And yet it wasn't until COVID hit that I think people really started to realize, oh my God, food insecurity could be part of modern life again. You know, we've been such, um, we've been blessed with so many years of abundance that we've developed metabolically dysregulated bodies and access to food has not been a concern. So people haven't really had to think about fasting, but now we do. And so I'm, you know, really passionate about getting people access to this technology. There's companies like Levels and NutriSense and um, another company in Marwood City, I can't remember the name at the top of my head, but lots of companies are coming out building software for making consumer um, interpretation, basically consumer software for existing medical devices. And even Google's developing work, um, developing a device with Dexcom to get out to more people. Um, really, you don't want to wait till you're pre-diabetic or a diabetic to care about your blood sugar. So blood sugar is one. And by blood sugar, I mean fasting blood sugar, postprandial blood sugar, post-meal, and then glycemic variability. So how variable is your blood sugar over time? Now, the second one is heart rate variability and stress, mark, stress monitoring. So I would say stress is, there's just there's really two facets of stress, right? There's an acute stress in the moment, and then there's the chronic stress you deal with on a regular basis. To assess for chronic stress, you need to have a cortisol test, which anyone who has ever had a functional medicine doctor knows a four-point cortisol test is a pretty strong assessment of where you are at and your ability to adapt to the stress levels in your life. But in the moment stress, an overnight, you know, basically wearing an aura ring, I don't have one on because it's charging right now, but you really want to be able to assess how are you managing stress? How are you recovering from stress? Are you waking up with poor recovery? That's why the aura ring is so important. Um, and heart rate variability is a good marker of if you're getting good quality rest or if you're not, if your stress levels are overloading your system, which we know taxes mitochondria and can reduce your energy levels. So those two areas are pretty darn important and they're very hand in hand. Um, and, you know, I would say um, there's probably a few other ones that I could go into, but those will be the biggest ones. And the nice ones about those are that they are markers of your ability to in the moment to handle stress. So there's different companies that are actually developing different tools to measure and modulate both blood sugar and stress levels. So I can go into some of those. There's a company called Leaf Therapeutics that's got a wearable heart rate variability monitor that's even beyond the aura ring because it's in the moment monitoring of your, of your levels of stress. And it can show you where your stress is during the day. Is it at work? Is it at home? Is it on your way to work? Is it with one specific person in your life that seems to cause you the most stress. A lot of people just don't understand where their stress comes from. And stress isn't good or bad, it's a part of life, but you need to understand when is it getting out of control and when is it starting to damage your body? So that's the way I, I conceptualize this. That's wonderful. So I think there's some really interesting markers there for, uh, for understanding the causes. What about actually helping improve the resilience, right? Actually yeah. getting people off the couch and getting to move and getting to do all the things that improve your resilience. Right. Well, one of the first things with blood sugar is experimenting with different types of nutritional styles to see where you land on the spectrum of metabolism. So there's basically like one side of the spectrum of, of macronutrients is the high fat, low carb. Other side of the spectrum is low carb, high fat. Um, a lot of people are like bandwagoning with like, I just believe that I'm everyone's supposed to be vegan or I believe everyone's supposed to be ancestral or keto. The reality is, is that you're supposed to be able to adapt to different food supplies. 
And yet you're going to probably find yourself on that spectrum somewhere that feels about normal. But occasionally, like for example, when I, whenever I eat consistently keto or ancestral, I, I oftentimes find myself wanting a cleanse that's more vegan or vegetarian. And then after being that way for a little while, I want to gear back to eating more of what feels right for my body. The same thing I've noticed in people who are vegan and vegetarian and high carb all the time. Sometimes they need to challenge their metabolism with a low carb diet too, in order to keep that metabolic flexibility strong. Um, that fasting is really something that almost everybody, whatever kind of ancestral or vegan and vegetarian diet you choose or Mediterranean diet, whatever kind of type of dietary style you choose, everyone benefits from some form of fasting. And whether it's just a 14 hour fast or a 24 hour fast, or if you're very comfortable with fasting, occasionally doing a three day fast, that teaches your body metabolic flexibility without you having to change your diet. So I'm a big believer in fasting. Thing. Somebody a device called Metaflow, and they created a device called the Lumen, and it's a respiratory quotient monitor that will help you determine where you're at in terms of fat or carb metabolism. So, learning about what is best for you through technology is a very new, new way of life. Not everybody's going to have access to this. Not everybody's going to even know about these devices, but they're out there, and they're starting to give us this insight into what we're doing and how we're living and how we're eating. One of the things I recommend most people need to think about is just trying to avoid packaged processed foods and high fat, high carb foods together should be minimized for an occasional treat. Um, these foods can cause metabolic gridlock in our mitochondria. They cause our mitochondria to be basically like, the mitochondria really wanna be operating on one, one gear or another gear. They don't really like to operate on two gears at the same time, it doesn't really work that way. So you gotta be really careful with how you're eating and whether or not you're, you're overeating. That's another thing you got to be careful of with your blood sugar is not overeating. Um, cause that really does tax the mitochondria, but you know, simple things like adding, you know, fiber into your diet. Um, if you're eating vegetarian or vegan, you probably have enough fiber unless you're the kind of processed vegan type of person, but almost everybody can benefit from adding extra fiber. If you add extra fiber into your diet and you develop lots of discomfort in your, in your, um, digestion, that's probably a sign that you might have some SIBO and you may actually need to do more fasting. So it's about giving your body what it needs, testing your body with new interventions, recognizing when you're eating too few, um, you know, grams of fiber per day, use the app chronometer, see what you're getting and don't just jump on the carnivore bag bandwagon because everybody else is going for that. Um, but experimenting with different dietary styles to learn how to train your metabolism to be, to be more metabolically flexible. So there's a bunch of different things, levers you can pull. Um, but starting with simple basics, like just a little bit of intermittent fasting, 14 hours a day. And like doing less is often the, the right thing. Just doing less, just eating less often, snacking less often, eating two meals and maybe one snack a day is probably what most adults need, not too much more than that. Um, the other side of the coin is the stress, right? So meditation, everyone always says meditation, 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 but most people, when they hear meditation, that freaks them out and they're like, I don't know how to sit still. I don't know how to be still. I don't even know how to breathe correctly. So learning how to just sit still and breathe slowly is amazing. And there's an app called Flowly, F-L-O-W-L-Y. That's all about just teaching you how to breathe in order to improve your heart rate variability. I love that app. They've got a little VR headset that you can, you can get through the subscription that you just slide your phone into. And once you've done eight sessions with just learning how to breathe correctly, you get to start doing these VR sessions. And it's really great for anxiety. It's really great for just relaxation, really great for inducing the relaxation response. Um, like I said, Leaf Therapeutics is great, but there's this company called Apollo Neuro and they have a really cool device that's a wearable that vibrates and it can use different frequencies of vibration to either calm you down or energize you. And I just ordered a new one because I um, you know, lost mine. And I just think that this device is game changing because what it's doing is it's activating the touch receptor pathways of your nervous system and sort of hacking your nervous system to make you feel a certain way that you don't even realize is even happening. You just turn it on set a setting on the app and then you forget about it. And I use this before going into meetings. I use this before I go on an airplane. It's a really great way to just like offload some of the work to a device 
without having to do anything. You just turn it on, press a button, boom, you're there. Um, other things that I love are a little bit more expensive things like, well, no, not necessarily. There's a thing, thing called a chi machine and it, and it takes your body and it moves your legs back and forth in a, in a vibrational pattern that gets you to just relax. Feels like you're being rocked to sleep. And my dad uses this. He thinks it's great. I showed it to him and he thinks it's awesome. Um, so it passed the parent test. Okay. Uh, I also love, you know, the infrared um, or the biomats, inframat by Healthy Line, biomats, the tra traditional infrared heating mat. Healthy Line makes a PEMF one now. Um, I love pulse electromagnetic frequencies. For some reason, um, these have really started to take off. There's, they, they hy hypothetically, they, they work on the mitochondria to help increase and promote energy. All right, so that was Dr. Molly Malouf, and I always love to touch in with her about all things technology because she has her finger on the pulse. So, you know, I'm, I'm super aware of the fact that this kind of technology is not being used in every functional medicine clinic across the country, but, you know, you will find more and more people coming into your clinics with this kind of technology. And I guess the number one thing that I want to share is that, and I want to come on the main screen for this, you know, is that one of the things that we're seeing, and, and Dr. Bland has really schooled me in this, is that as a large percentage of the population starts to get numbers from wearable devices like heart rate variability, like con uh, uh, continuous glucose uh, blood monitoring, then people start to understand and work from not their symptoms, but from those numbers. And when they start doing that, that is when functional medicine becomes the standard of care. Because once you start knowing yourself that well and measuring yourself in those kind of ways, you're never going to go back to just waiting until symptoms show up and going in that direction. Yes, for acute things, but functional medicine and understanding you know, the body's function is going to be just the default. And that's why there's this incredible uh, potential of, of where things are, are moving. And ultimately, it's probably taken longer than we all thought. Like right at the beginning of the functional forum six years ago, I was talking about wearable tech. And now we do have some useful stuff. I think that continuous glucose monitor is definitely something that uh, more and more people will start to use. And we are seeing just people starting to use it outside of just diabetics being, uh, being um, recommended for it. So that's the, the first piece, which is sort of like, let's look at the technology side of resilience. But I guess the next thing that I wanted to, to talk about is what about genetics? Like what percentage of our genes uh, you know, come, uh, what percentage of our resilience comes from our genes and what percentage of our resilience comes from the choices that we make? And, you know, can you actually get a look into people's resilience and how they will cope under stress uh, from genetic information? Um, as some of you guys know, if you've been watching for a long time, in 2017, we did the uh, Interpreting Your Genetics Summit. And as part of that, uh, I had my own genetics uh, uh, sort of read by Dr. Yael Joffe. And I wanted to bring her back on to just chat a little bit about genetics, because even though I know that more and more, this is another area where, you know, as patients start to really dive into understanding their own genetics and getting their own genetic information, this is where functional medicine and functional medicine clinics could, could shine or should shine. And if we, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this in is because you know, what we're seeing with COVID is that many functional, many, many uh, primary care and, uh, and, and family medicine doctors are out of business. And, you know, I think that as they come back into business, they're going to be looking for ways to differentiate themselves if they move to models like direct primary care. And I think that genetics is, is definitely one thing that the sort of patients are looking for, and it's a great way to differentiate. Now, up until now, there really hasn't been a way to do it efficiently in sort of like short appointments. But I wanted to share with Dr. Joffe because we're going to be, you know, catching up with her during this year because uh, this is something so that a warm we've been working on significantly. So to answer the questions, how do our genes affect our resilience? Let's check in for a quick update from Dr. Yael Joffe. So Dr. Joffe, uh, just, I guess, to, to kick this off, what role do you feel that genetics plays in the technology of resilience? Oh, thanks, James. You know, it's, it's a really interesting one because we never talk about resilience and genetics and we never probably think about resilience and genetics. And, 
you know, when you go and you have a look at the literature, it's actually quite a powerful impact. So when we talk about heritability, heritability gives us a sense of just how much does genetics actually play a role. And the stats are amazing. You know, we've seen some statistics come out that between 40 to 60 percent of our resilience is going to be driven by our genes. Now, when we talk about resilience, it doesn't matter if it's an emotional trauma or a physical trauma. It doesn't matter if it's something like PTSD, depression, anxiety. There's going to be an interaction between a whole group of genes and some kind of environmental input or trauma. And it's going to have an impact on, on our phenotype or our health or our well-being. And so when we start looking at resilience, we start realizing that these are pathways that we've actually been talking about for quite some time, like serotonin and dopamine, HPA axis, um, noradrenaline. And of course, there's genes. There's genes in those pathways and they're gene variants. And whether an individual has more or less of those gene variants will impact how optimally those pathways are functioning. So when we start putting together these pieces of optimal function in dopamine, serotonin, HSM, with, with our environmental input, which is trauma or change or whatever that may be, or physical trauma, we're going to see a manifestation of resilience. And that can be a whole spectrum from, from PTSD and, and um, depressive disorder to anxiety disorders right through to kind of the other side, which is resilience. And of course, it's a spectrum. Yeah, one of the things that I've seen recently is uh, is just the, the way in which trauma kind of manifests downstream as physical illness. So, I, I, so it sounds like what you're saying is that the same trauma comes in at the top and where it manifests is going to be dependent on your genetic makeup. That's right. So when we look at genetics, we always look at two pieces of the puzzle. The one is from a DNA sequence. I have gene variants, so there's a differences in my DNA sequence that will make those pathways that drive resilience more optimal or less optimal. So I'm processing dopamine more optimally or I've got a comped gene variant that is affecting how optimal my, my dopamine processes. That is nutrigenetics. But there's another really interesting angle which is gene expression or gene behavior. So when a trauma comes in, it's, it's, like, it, it's like switching on a switch or switching off a switch. And whether that trauma is, in, is, is emotional or physical, it's going to switch on gene switches in these pathways. So the great thing about this is the DNA sequence differences gives us insight into our susceptibility. How optimally are we in these stress response pathways? But our environment will determine how these genes are switched on and off. And so when we're working with individuals or patients, what we wanna do is understand their susceptibility, to being resilient or not resilient. And then we want to think about how can we change the environment to increase resilience by optimizing those, those gene switches. And what are some of the best ways to navigate uh, that decision-making process? Well, I, I mean, for, so there's two ways. One is we start with the genetic test, but remember when we do genetic testing, we don't want to look at a single SNP. We don't want to say, oh, COMPT is the absolute, you know, if you have COMPT, you're going to be depressed, or if you have COMPT, you're going to be anxious. Because COMPT is only one part of a whole biochemical pathway. So the first most important thing is when we look at genetic sequence or genetic variants, we want to look at the pathway that COMPT is a part of because there are other genes that are also in that pathway. And we want to understand what are the other genes acting together with COMPT and impacting that pathway. So that would be my first recommendation is working with gene tests that group genes into pathways to be able to understand how optimal it is. The second part of it is understanding, which is not something we learn at university and we have to go up to learn afterwards, is how do we use nutrition and, and lifestyle, whether it's meditation, whether it's massage or whether it's exercise, to switch on and switch off genes to be able to help the individual heal themselves. Because sometimes taking a, a vitamin C supplement isn't always the answer. Sometimes we want the right food or supplement that switches on a gene that enables us to heal. And whether that's um, serotonin transporters or dopamine transporters, we want to understand the biochemistry of that environmental stimulus switching on switch. And that, that comes with time and learning. Beautiful. All right.
So lots to learn there. And Dr. Joffe is, is really uh, strong when it comes to nutrigenomics. And I think the pathway understanding of genomics, you know, is going to be a huge uh, future way of the sort of intersection of genomic science and functional medicine. And I'm super excited to, you know, continue that conversation as we move forward through this year of, uh, of, of our year of resilience. So the next question that I wanted to ask for all of us to, to get into here today is, how can we use technology to support building resilience, right? If we're talking about the technology of resilience, how can we use technology to support our patients in building resilience? And, you know, I wanted to focus on something that everyone could do because ultimately, you know, the, the, the wearables and the genetic testing, I know that that, you know, there's a lot of um, things that go into whether or not you could actually be doing this in practice now. But one of the areas that I wanted to get into was to talk about telemedicine and specifically group medical visits. So later this, early this year, we've had a couple of sessions on the power of virtual group visits and how virtual group visits are being used uh, to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer interaction and engage people into facilitating uh, healthy behaviors. Now, Dr. Cheng Ron, um, he's been on the forum a few times in the last couple of years. I really think he's doing some of the most innovative work in the field. And he has come up with a strategy that uses remote patient monitoring and virtual group visits to deliver really decentralized care, which I think is the future of care. You're seeing lots of more, lots of people talking about home hospitals and doing things, uh, you know, uh, hospitals at home and, and decentralized care, not having everyone come into the same place. So the first thing that um, I, I wanted to share was a little bit about, I interviewed him uh, a couple months ago and a really, really, really interesting thing came up. And this is gonna be especially interesting for all of you people out there who are working with patients on their diet, which let's be honest, is everyone in the functional integrated medicine from health coach to, you know, to specialist diet is gonna be able to play a big role. Now, one of the things you have to recognize is that people will lie to you when they tell you what they eat, right? Ever go to a doctor and the doctor asks how many drinks of alcohol you have in a typical week? Did you tell them the truth or did you modulate it slightly? So how can we actually go to the environment where people live, where your patients actually are and seeing what's going on in their actual lives? Cheng made this, uh, this, this uh, observation on his virtual group visits and I wanted to share it with all of you because I think it really goes into how we can use technology to build resilience. I know you were doing a lot of group medical visits before yes. COVID hit, and now you, you've translated that online. What do people need and what are, they, what are they getting from these groups that they've not got from medicine before? So let me tell you, um, when we started doing group visits uh, about, a, I guess a couple years ago now, um, it was very hard and really took us a whole year and a half to kind of get used to it because um, it's not just, okay, well now I have group visits and patients come. And so, uh, what we found was that we learned a lot more from the patients themselves um, in, a, in a group setting. And in fact, people are like, well, how can you deliver individualized care? Well, actually, the group setting allows individualized care um, because um, more things come out. We find out a lot more in history. I had patients that I've known for seven years uh, came out and said something in the group visit I wish I had known seven years ago, right? And so, uh, so what we noticed is that when we formed these groups, uh, people in the groups uh, really held on to a very strong bond and that allowed more healing to, to, uh, to happen. And then people were more compliant. Uh, you know what, I'm not gonna use the word compliant. People were more, uh, more engaged and more motivated uh, to do things for themselves, uh, the things that we actually recommend. And but at the same time, that also allowed for a bi-directional interface. Well, what's the other direction back is when people get in a new group, they give us feedback to our processes because we ask for our processes. What did you think of the group? Do you find value in this? What did you wish you had? Those are the things that we can do as a group. That's, that's translates to more of the improvement of medicine that we, that we couldn't do otherwise. So when COVID hit, um, telemedicine couldn't do groups on telemedicine immediately just because we didn't really have the infrastructure to do so um and so you know people miss the groups and in whenever we send out email newsletters and people are like i can't wait till i go back into these groups again um and that was something that was really rewarding to see so now we started doing 
uh, my health coaches, uh, my two health coaches started doing their own groups right now. And we'll transition the providers back into the groups on a telemedicine side. So it's a group, tele, Zoom, et cetera, if you will. And, uh, and so far, um, that's provided in a, a very large benefit that I never really thought about is that when people are in their home environment and they're in a call like this, like you're seeing right now, and when there's maybe 10 people that are in there, all in their home and environments, one of the coolest things I, I, I've seen is that uh, you, you remember as kids, we used to do show and tell <laughs> in school. Yeah. And so people were like, look at my, look at my, you know, fermented cabbage that I made. Oh, this is Korean, et cetera. So people start sharing what they were doing and people were getting so excited in the groups. And that's something, that's not something I experienced as a one-on-one um, uh, sessions. It's not something that we can experience even in person group sessions. And so people started saying, hey, this is, you know, they, they will take their phone. They'll say, hey, this is my fridge. This is what I do now. This is what I used to do before. And there were so much interaction now that um, that becomes a really fun environment to just see engaged people at home. And it's a very new type of bi-directional interface now. So now in my notes, we're literally typing, patient showed us the fridge and you know he has X, Y, and Z in there, but I see a bag of Cheetos on the side, so maybe we'll address that the next visit. <laughs> yeah, I really love that. Isn't that great? You know, I really feel like when I first heard that, I just thought so many practitioners would resonate with that concept, which is, you know, you are you are disconnected from the reality of your patient's environment when you're only having an appointment with them at your office. And one of these amazing things about telemedicine, and I know that that many of you are, are doing one on one telemedicine, even if you're not doing groups, but the opportunity to say, hey, are you on your phone right now? take me to the fridge. Let's go and take a look what's in there. Show me the kitchen. Let's see what's going on. You know, when Dr. Chatterjee did his doctor in the house show, the big thing was that now there was an opportunity for him to be able to go into the house and see what was going on. And that TV show, you know, was really amazing because it really took all, you know, it created a whole new opportunity for everyone to, you know, to, to really think differently about what it means to actually change someone's environment, right? If we want to get people well, we have to change their environment. And I think that telemedicine provides this opportunity to be able to get inside people's homes and see what's really going on there. Yes, in a one-on-one, -on -one, and that can be powerful, but imagine getting groups of people where everyone's doing a show and tell and showing their fridge. You know, you'd see very quickly that if, if everyone was in a group and one person just had really unhealthy stuff in the fridge and everyone else was doing a healthy diet, that I bet you that that would be more likely to change their behavior than anything that you could say, anything that you could do, any telling off you could give them, any authority you could lord over them. This is the power of the group. And this is why, you know, we've been so hot on this topic. That's why I wrote the book about it. I know you I just realized that this was, you know. So we are talking about the technology and so, of resilience. And, and so, you know, I, I really just wanted to jump into that conversation to be able to, to showcase with all of you that there are significant other benefits to being able to run. Uh, you know, these virtual group visits. And when I, when I was talking about virtual group visits, we had Dr. Christopher Moat, uh, who we're going to have next month, talking about how he does his lab review in a group. And I think there's so much uh, that we can learn uh, from actually getting inside the homes of people through telemedicine. And I hope that this learning that we're having by everyone doing telemedicine now in functional medicine will actually create some anti-fragility. Right, we'll create a structure and a system by which we actually come out of COVID understanding that there are real benefits to being virtual for care. And yes, there are real benefits to being in person, but there are real benefits to being virtual as well. And we'll start to think about those benefits. And if we if we can bring that into our care, we can create a really a much higher standard of care by using a hybrid model. So I just wanted to share that with you because I think whatever kind of practice you're in, I think that's a, a really interesting uh, way of looking at things. So the next question is, you know, what really is our technology of resilience, right? We've, we've seen Molly Maloof talk about, uh, you know, some of the different uh, technologies that you can use to measure resilience. 
Uh, we heard Dr. Joffe talking about genetics and, and what that means with regards to resilience. And then Dr. Ron there talking a little bit about how he used virtual group visits to get inside people's home. But what is the actual technology that facilitates resilience? It's this, it's this human body. And at the annual conference for the Institute for Functional Medicine, one of my favorite talks was from Dr. Patrick Hannaway. And he got really real about, you know, something that's gone on in his life and, and his own health. And I think that it was, it had some incredible messages in it that I really wanted to share as part of this forum. So enjoy. So we are talking about the technology of resilience. And I know that there are many different, you know, we've had a lot of different thoughts about that uh, throughout this, you know, throughout this show. But, you know, at the uh, Institute for Functional Medicine's annual conference, uh, I, you know, I heard your talk there and uh, it really helped me to, to understand and, and uh, kind of some of the way that you think about what the technology of resilience is. And maybe we could just start there. Well, the, the topic of, of resilience is one of how do we move to optimize our wealth, health and well-being as we move through, you know, the various slings and arrows of outrageous fortune of life. How do we move in a way that allows us to be able to deal with the ups and downs that come? We're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. But we have the opportunity to be able to learn through the process and to have some compassion, you know, for ourselves And... You know, as, as you said uh, you know, in, in my talk, I, I sort of got the, the up close and personal uh, opportunity to be able to learn from this in a, in a big way, you know, really transformative way for me. And that is, you know, I've known about the various kinds of tools uh, that are going to be, you know, working with lifestyle and nutrition and sleep and exercise and, and, and purpose and meaning and connectivity. And I've had a very blessed life and a, a very great opportunities to be able to learn and teach and yet um, you know that being diagnosed a, a year and a half ago now with a stage four laryngeal cancer really you know I, let's say caught my attention um, it caught all a hundred percent of my attention and what do I have to learn how do I move with this and how do I open up to learning and growing from this I've told people for many, many years, cancer is a teacher about transformation. It's an invitation to make a transformation. And so then I had to look and say, well, what's that for me? And where do I find the resilience, you know, to move through the, you know, Valpurgis knock, the dark night of the soul to, to be able to find well, what is it that I have to learn and grow? And, and for me, how can I help other people? Um, on the other end of it. But during the middle of it, my focus was on myself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an you know, incredible, uh, incredible insight. So, so what did you find when you went looking? Well, I've, um, you know, I've worked with, uh, with indigenous elders for a long period of time. And, and um, right away, they helped me to see that, like, you know, I'd been, I'd been calling for for change, for something to shift in my life. And it's like, oh, this is it. You know, I'm like, well, this isn't what I asked for, but this is it. And how to then really work to integrate, you know, those aspects of those kinds of teachings and energetic healing, energy medicine, nutrition, uh, caring for self, and, you know, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. It's all a part holism is the whole it's everything and you know certainly if i had a lower stage cancer i may have worked to try to do it without some of the more aggressive kinds of modalities um, but i didn't really want to leave anything on the table i wanted to have the opportunity to be able to do the best that i could and you know listening asking questions discernment and feeling um, and this is a big one, so I'm, I'm actually tearing up a little bit, but feeling okay being in the absolute uncertainty of it. I don't actually know what's going to happen in my life. I don't actually know if these things are going to work. And there's a piece that is here in this part on resilience that I think is really important. And that is, it's about vulnerability and opening oneself up to that. And that in that place, there is more aliveness in the world. It's, it's amazing. It's like there's no preconception. It's, it's total presence. 
and that caught me by surprise. Um, and I'm glad that I was able to go to that place. And I'm reminded now that I need to continue to go to that place to create spaciousness in my life, to have to connect with vulnerability rather than being armored in my approach. When I, and it's particularly true when I when I think I know something and someone else has a different perspective. What do I have to learn? How do I listen uh, to my colleagues and how do I listen to my patients? Yeah, that's such a such an interesting point there. I mean, it, it seems like a lot of resilience is actually created uh, in relation to others. You know, there's definitely the internal work that's happening uh, to to build up that resilience. But I think one of the things I got from your talk was just a reinforcement of you know what you've you know what you've been talking about, and and so certainly the way that like care is now delivered at the Cleveland Clinic, and it's it's this. There's a there's a peer to peer kind of delivery of value, and there's a peer to peer technology when it comes to creating resilience. Exactly, and and so working in teams, not not trying to do it yourself, and being able to have that cross fertilization, and then as you've been doing work with moving into the place of of having people work and relate with each other as groups and communities of people to be supportive of each other, you know that that it it creates, it moves away from the expert model to the one of a network model of learning and growing together. And what do we have to do? And all of us are going to stumble at various points in time and none of us are going to know everything. So doesn't it make sense to be able to work together and to cross fertilize those ideas, not coming from a place of ego and knowing, but from a place, you know, of learning and caring and humility and, and vulnerability. You know, those are, that's a different way of, of moving towards health. And I don't even like to say practicing medicine anymore. I really want to focus on promoting health. It's like, that's what we're trying to do. You know, so when I have, you know, cancer patients come to me, you know, I say like, I'm not the expert on chemotherapy, but what I do want to do is I feel like I can help you be the best you the healthiest you going into this journey. And I'll continue to walk with you on that journey, on that process. So that's helping to cultivate resilience in that individual as well. You know, it's like they don't have some expectation of what they're supposed to do. They know that it's gonna be a journey and they know that there are, are people along the way who are gonna help them. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in all of your, uh, in all of your experience of this this last year and a half uh, as well i know that um there's been part of it that's been you know your own healing hearing healing journey but also you know you're a doctor and you're seeing patients and you're working with people and now in a virtual environment um has there been any uh lessons that you've you've taken from your experience into a virtual environment that can help you know all of those doctors who are who are watching or practitioners who are watching who are maybe you know, interacting with patients in a virtual environment for the first time. Yeah, well, I had, um, you know, my patients have been around the country for, for some period of time, but I've always said, like, I need to see you first. I need to meet you first. You need to come here and we need to, you know, have like our first deep intake, you know, and then I'll work with you from there. And obviously since, uh, since March, that hasn't been able to happen. And so there are still people who want to see me and the laws have changed. And so now, you know, I'm seeing new patients virtually as well and that's been a, a, a shift and a very interesting one in that while I don't have the same kind of, of intuitive feeling um, that I have in sitting with somebody um, instead I'm getting different cues you know I'm getting the cues of the um, of the, the the Indian family uh, in the and the older brother who's coming in and, and photobombing, you know, the, the, the session with the, the, the 15 year old and that, and that grandma from India is there. And, you know, I can see the whole family uh, or, you know, talking to one patient and he's in his kitchen, a very nice kitchen. And, and I was like, show me what's in your refrigerator, you know, and it's like, open up the refrigerator and we talk about the food that's in his refrigerator. And it's like, I would never have those kinds of insights 
by having someone come to to my office, to my clinic. And, and we have a beautiful old home uh, that we see people in, in, in Asheville. But, you know, it's a lovely spot, but it's my spot. You know, it's like, what, what is it like when I'm meeting with them in their homes? And it reminds me back to when I was, you know, in medical school and, you know, began work with public health nurses to do home visits. And I learned so much about what's happening with people when I went into their homes. And now virtually we're having the opportunity to do that. You know, so like where there's, you know, some potential downsides of not having, you know, the personal uh, connection of touch. Um, there is this other insight that is a greater awareness of the context of their lives. And that's something that is really helping me to be able to understand and support them. And I would also say that the, the emotional connection with people has gone deeper than I thought it would. Even, even in a new visit, there's a, a willingness and a vulnerability to open oneself up um, that I found to be really profound and has frankly surprised me. Beautiful words from, from Dr. Hannaway. Definitely one of my favorite people in the functional integrative world. And uh, you'll be hearing a bit more from him. We had actually a really great discussion. I'm going to put the, the whole discussion up on the YouTube channel because um, it went a lot further than that. And I've got a little clip more uh, before we uh, finish here today. Um, so we and I wanted to just share some resources. Like if you, if, if what Dr. Ron said and, and now um, what Dr. Hannaway said are resonating and you need help, to get online, you know, we created with the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center, the virtual practice pivot. If you go to goevomed.com slash pivot, you can download that guide. Super awesome resource to make it really easy for you to go online. And then what should you do once you get online? Once you actually have the capability of doing virtual visits, how can you then, uh, you know, build and run your practice in, in the most effective way? And if you're interested in group visits, check out our practitioner interest group. You can look for that on Facebook. And if you go to goevomed.com slash GVT, uh, you can create, you can uh, use some of the group visit toolkits from the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. And I want to give a special shout out to the Well Matrix series, which is their newest one, which is really about cultivating resilience. There's a ton of good information on some of the topics that, you know, Molly Maloof talked about tonight, metabolic flexibility. Um, this is what resilience is all about. And uh, we have a ton of resources from Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. Just speed up your ability to start uh, delivering value in, in that way. So um, that's, where, that's, that's where to look for some of those resources. Now, I guess the, the last question that I asked Patrick and I wanted to, to finish on tonight is, is this going to catch on? And... Uh, let me leave you with this from Dr. Patrick Hannaway. Well, just on that point, you know, you've, you've been involved in the Cleveland Clinic project where, you know, over a period of time, um, a major medical institution is, is step by step starting to understand this thinking process, right? And it's, you know, taken a while. And ultimately, you know, there's a lot of inertia in medicine to do things the way that they've always done. Do you see any, you know, from your position, do you see any uh, signs that that COVID, and, and maybe it's just way too early to tell, but that the, the fact that, you know, we can understand people's immune resilience in terms of function, and, and the fact that there's such a range of um, effect within sort of a, a similar population um, that is, again, determined by function, that that the thinking process of, of um, medicine um, could, the, we could bust through some inertia and have functional medicine start to, the, the, at least the, the, found, the, the some of those principles of, of, of what you just shared uh, become more um, widely adopted? Well, we, we see that there's, there are thought leaders and there are people who are, you know, at the, at the peak of their, of their expertise who are recognizing we don't have all the tools that we need to be able to help this. What else can we do? And they're less interested in trying to say this is the way it has to be done and more interested in saying what more can we do? And so those people are looking out and saying, are there other kinds of um, approaches that will help us? in this way. You know, that's the 
purpose of what we're, why we're bringing these ideas forward in a way that is actually very similar to a drug discovery clinical translation model. You know, we're going in and we're saying, okay, well, let's look at the ACE2 receptor and how SARS-CoV-2 binds to it. And as we do that, you know, lo and behold, there are these three drugs, but there are these 12 different uh, botanicals that actually have an impact right at that spot. And, and you know, they not only have an impact there, but they also have an impact on being able to help modulate the immune system in order to be able to support it. Oh gosh, the same thing is working in two different places. And you know what? It also has an effect on being able to change the balance of, of, uh, of both clotting and bleeding, of fibrinolysis and thrombosis that's happening. It's like, oh, it, it works there too. Oh, maybe that's the right agent for this patient and how do we do that? So we're just demonstrating like here's the thought process. It's rigorous. It's using the same kinds of, of process that, that drug discovery does, and it's clinical translation. And there's not the same kinds of side effects. And what we see right now, because you know, we we want to be involved in the development and creation of clinical trials around this, you know, but there are there, there is a need for people right now. So if we have something, I could talked about the standards, if we have something that we've defined the risk of harm and the risk of harm is minimal or mild for these kinds of tools, um, really the precautionary principle tells us there's little downside risk to trying these kinds of tools. Now, we can't go and promote them and say that, that you know, uh, Scutellaria bicolis cures COVID-19. No, we can't say that. We don't know that. But we can say that this Chinese skullcap has some very specific effects on these points in the mechanism of action and supporting the immune system that may be useful for people. And there's very little risk associated with it. So let's give them the information and allow them to go forward. And where, where I become hopeful is to see something like, uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen this guy who runs a, a podcast or a, 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 a teaching uh, platform called medcram.com. Read about it, yeah. Okay. So, you know, he's, he's out there and he's talking about, you know, he's, so he's a, a pulmonary, a pulmonologist who's an intensivist and he's been seeing patients with COVID and, you know, and he's been talking now 80 plus sessions you know, talking about the pathophysiology and what to do and where's the data talking about all aspects of it but he's talking about like let's look at the data on vitamin d this is really curious that th this is much greater in areas where there's a vitamin d deficit and here's studies on what vitamin d does let's look at the immune system and what we what we need to do and if we can change the curve to strengthen the immune system of people and use these couple of botanical agents and a couple of nutritional aspects that are helpful to decrease the severity of illness for 10% of the population, then all of a sudden we've got enough ventilators for the people who are sick. It's like, well, that's a reasonable way of doing it instead of saying, stay home and don't touch anything and don't see anybody and extract yourself from everything as the only thing. And if you get sick, then just stay away from everybody and just wait to see if the shoe drops. It's like, well, that's probably not the best way to optimize health and well-being. Not unlike the cancer patients I was talking about. It's like, I want you to be the healthiest person possible when you become infected with COVID. That means you're going to be less likely to develop a severe illness that will require hospitalization or that you could die from. You know, that's what we're trying to do. And people are open to that, but it's a new paradigm. It's a new way of thinking about it because, you know, the focus has been really on the warrior mentality of we have to kill it. And, you know, if the idea is, well, how about, you know, as we're seeing with the, the military now saying, how about if we focus on making our soldiers better soldiers, stronger and, and able to discern and critically think, and maybe that will help in, in the process of it as well. So I am hopeful and, you know, we are, we're in a point where the, the game is changing very rapidly. And so we see allies who we didn't think were there before because they're open to new ideas because ultimately, and this is where I think sometimes the, the conventional healthcare system gets a wrap, but you know, doctors care for people. They want 
to get people better. You know, that's what they want to do. And so we're in a situation where now how do we help them to have some simple tools that they can use, that they can trust and be able to go forward. So we're making small inroads into various kinds of, of healthcare institutions and including, you know, working with, uh, with the military and being able to say, how do we bring these things into the military space? And there's an openness there. Really, really exciting stuff from Dr. Hannaway. And I just wanted to share that because, you know, I think we all hope that functional medicine is going to become the standard of care sooner or later, at least some of these ideas that we'd be talking about, um, you know, when it comes to resilience and understanding resilience. Last month, we did immune resilience. And, you know, those ideas need to be mainstream if we're really going to, you know, deal with future infectious agents and we're going to create a really resilient population and so i think there's a lot to be excited about to see that as patrick said some allies coming along that we didn't think of as allies before and some allies emerging who are looking for this and it's it's really great to just see um the numbers of uh, of of new connections that are being made and that's why i wanted to just uh, i guess give a little bit of a preview of next month um, which we are going to be talking about community resilience. And uh, actually, I had the well, just on that the other day to visit Adventist Health, which actually the headquarters is just about half an hour from my house in Sacramento in Roseville, California. And this is Dr. Jeffrey Egler. And Dr. Egler uh, was hired by Adventist Health, which is a pretty massive organization. It's, uh, it's more than 20 hospitals, more than 300 clinics. Um, it's been in four states. But the big news is, is that in April, during the lockdown, Adventist Health acquired the Blue Zone organization. So Adventist Health has moved from an organization that was, you know, that is runs a few hospitals in the Western states of America, I think Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, and California, to a serious player in the future of health. And they hired Dr. Egler because of his functional medicine pedigree. And so what's really exciting to see is that, you know, where once Cleveland Clinic was a great example, now we're starting to see other big organizations realize. And, you know, on the wall, like if you think about Adventist, right, this is started by the Seventh-day Adventist. On the wall, they have the Thomas Edison quote uh, about um, the doctor of the future not treating disease and teach people that it's better to know how to keep well than cure disease. Adventist is coming back to its roots and is really, you know, coming to this idea that, that Patrick shared there a minute ago, that what we're really talking about is, is creating health. It's not so much about practicing medicine, it's about creating health. And that's what we're all doing in, in, this, in this field. And that's why we created the meetup groups. You know, we created the Functional Forum meetup groups to get groups of practitioners together to realize that um, they're actually so much more uh, similar than they are different, whether that be, you know, integrated medicine, naturopathic medicine, lifestyle medicine, functional medicine, holistic medicine, um, even, you know, the, the working with, you know, chiropractic medicine and, and, and traditional Chinese medicine, like all of these concepts have these concepts of resilience and these concepts of root cause resolution and health creation as chronic disease care. And so I know at the moment it's difficult to get together in person. And I know that even just today here, 13th of July, 2020, um, as of today, California is going back into pretty much shelter in place. And so, you know, I, I, I know that the timing is, is interesting for community, but at the same time, there are resilient communities uh, starting and, and being uh, supported all around. I'd be going to a meetup uh, that is happening uh, just up the road from me. And we're doing a picnic in September, masked if you need to, social distance if you need to, but outdoors and a way to keep practitioners together. And I think that as we move into this next phase, we realize just how much value we get from each other. And so we've got some exciting things uh, coming up later in the year to really facilitate uh, community amongst practitioners. So this has been the technology of resilience. I hope you've learned something here tonight. Uh, next month, we are gonna be talking about community resilience. Uh, we are gonna be coming 
from Eventist. Uh, we recorded all the sessions there. We'll be hearing from Dr. Egler as they talk about the exciting things that they've been doing at Eventist Health to bring together the worlds of you know, medical care and community health through this acquisition of the Blue Zones Project. We're going to be talking to, Doc, uh, to John Weeks, who's one of the most visible people in the industry. And uh, we did a great interview with him uh, last year at the uh, Integrated Medicine for the Underserved Conference uh, about community resilience and uh, his insights from being the editor in chief of the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, and particularly the, uh, the Group Delivered Services uh, edition that they did. And we'll also be touching in with Dr. Christopher Moat, who uh, will be talking about his efforts at community resilience. So I really appreciate you being here for the Functional Forum. Thanks so much for being here this evening. Um, it's been great to continue doing these Functional Forums, even in lockdown. It does have its own technical challenges, and I wish I could be with you wherever you are. But thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.